good evening, one and all. Welcome to those who are visitors, first-timers, to those who might be just re-upping, rejoining. Special welcome to our young people home from college and other family members in from out of town. You are welcome here. We are blessed as each of us comes and brings our faith, lifting up our hearts and having reasons to look to the Lord as our Savior, to be renewed in hope, because each of us has need of the promises of God. We speak a lot about hope, about that virtue that focuses our attention and attitude towards some future goal. You know, when we hope for something, we plan for it, we anticipate it, we take steps for it to come to pass. And sometimes hopes are dashed. That's the nature of our world. We get discouraged, we get disappointed. I faced disappointment just yesterday and today as I was promised guaranteed pre-Christmas shipping and did not get it on the last several items. So this morning I went to my printer and printed out pictures of the gifts that I wrapped in boxes and that my family members will receive tomorrow with the promise that they'll get it when they get it. <laughs> Hope sometimes is dashed. There's a famous quote a couple of years ago, Hope is a tease designed to prevent us from accepting reality. Anybody know who said that? No, no, nobody's been able to guess. Um, and it wasn't some famous politician or anybody like that. It was uh, Dame Maggie Smith, otherwise known as Violet Crawley, the Dowager Countess of Grantham in Downton Abbey. One of her great zinger lines, I've become a huge Downton fan, binge watching it. This summer made the pilgrimage to Highclere Castle in England, just nerded out completely. But it was one of her zingers, hope is a tease designed to prevent us from accepting reality. That's not exactly inspiring or encouraging, but in our world today, many speak of false hopes, disappointments, ongoing frustrations, and we've all experienced them in one way or another or in countless ways, living as we are still in the wake of pandemic, economic uncertainty, and political strife. But the virtue of hope from a spiritual context says that we focus our attention, our attitude, and action toward the future fulfillment of God, the realization and completion of God's plan for us, ultimately a plan destined for heaven. We gather here because God promises something altogether different and that St. Paul reminds us, hope does not disappoint, because God is faithful to his word. We have experienced a lot that could lead us to discouragement in these past couple of years. I don't need to dwell on those things. But it's not all bad news. There is hope among us. In the midst of all the struggles, there are wonders to behold. We experience it daily if we know how to look. We train our vision to see. I look around our community and see, and even in the midst of economic uncertainty, outpouring of generosity for those in need, perhaps now more than ever, people stepping up with wondrous charity. This year, as in past years, so much done to help those in need, especially at this time of year with our Adopt-A-Family program the giving trees, the poor boxes, our Thanksgiving food drive last month. But think of being moved in different ways as you encounter God's presence, taking in the wonder of God's creation and the beauty of a sunrise or a sunset, the majesty of a mountain range, the power of waves crashing on the shore, moments of conversion when hearts are softened by acts of kindness or charity, or as someone comes to know the Lord. I had a particular encounter with holiness earlier this week. Some of you may know I serve on the board of directors at St. Joseph Medical Center in Towson. 
I have no medical background whatsoever. I serve on the board uh, as one of the Catholic identity reps because St. Joseph maintains that identity as a Catholic healthcare institution. I've learned a lot about medicine, I'm not in any expert way. I sit there dumbfounded most of the time when they talk about medical things. Uh, one of the committees I serve on has been gradually touring and each month when we meet, we visit a different unit to learn about what they're doing, what they're excelling in, what they struggle with, what they need, what the board can do to help, how we can work with them. And this week we visited the NICU, which is both heartbreaking and filled with hope at the same time. But they were talking about different treatments and they were talking about just what happens in the birth of a child. And I walked away from that moment in awe at the wonder of creation. And they were talking about that as the mother goes into labor, all these things start to happen, are triggered in the body of the baby to prepare it for birth. I mean, not just the turning around and things, but they were talking about the lungs, how the lungs begin to expel all the liquid that's built up in the womb to prepare the child to take its first breath of air. And all of that happens by design. And I was simply bowled over at the wonder of creation, that God has planned this. This is no coincidence, but this is God. And if God can do all of this just to bring us to birth, how much more does he promise to do to bring us to new life, to save us, to be with us, for his hand to be with us in our lives? And this is the wonder we celebrate that God sends his son, born into almost tragic circumstances in poverty, but it's the wonder of new life, of a baby, in simplicity, that fills us with hope at what can happen. We sing tonight with the psalmist, Psalm 98, all the ends of the earth have seen the saving power of God. We do see it if we strive to look. Tonight we hear about good news proclaimed to the shepherds. You know, most people didn't notice the birth of the Savior, save Mary and Joseph and the few privileged ones to whom the message was announced by the choir of angels to the shepherds who were poor, living in the fields with the sheep. They were not exactly in the center of culture or society, but that's where the good news was proclaimed to those in need. And maybe to hear the good news, we have to put ourselves in the positions of being in need, recognizing that we need a savior so that the good news of the savior's birth can touch our hearts all the more. At any given moment, there are those among us who are grieving, who are suffering, who are facing illness, living with heavy burdens in life. The message of this feast calls us to be in those places where we are vulnerable, where we are hurting, where we are longing, because it's there that perhaps we might be more ready to perceive, to recognize, to behold, and to cherish the good news of the birth of our Savior. So if you are hurting, perhaps your heart is more open to behold and see that God is good. For all of us, our call is to embrace hope, not some fleeting sentiment of holiday spirit, that's all well and good, but this deep-rooted hope that defies logic or expectations and that it's rooted in a promise that this world can't give pointing us to the promise of something wondrous, something lasting, something permanent, and something holy. Hope is within our reach. The French novelist Victor Hugo said, hope is the word which God has written on the brow of every man. God reaches down 
reaches into our lives to touch us, to inspire us, to draw us in so as to save us. So let us be attentive to signs, to recognize that God is with us as we celebrate him born into human history, not just as an historic moment, but with an effect on us here and now. Be open to the gifts of God. Recognize what the birth of the Savior means tonight in our lives as our God comes to save us. Amen.